Today I'm going to do a teaching. This is probably not going to be me jumping up and down and preaching. It might be. Who knows what's going to happen? Um, you never, you can never tell. But um, today I'm going to be uh, doing a teaching about something that, um, well, for lack of better words, is is going to further define our church. Um, Those who do not believe in the manifest power and presence of God, um, I'm not sure I want them here. Unless they want to change. Dissenters tend to, you know, you're, 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 Influence people, you're influencing people whether you want to believe it or not. And the people you're around influence you whether you want to believe it or not. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And when I'm done today in preparation for this service, I've been praying and thinking about this for about a month now. In preparation for this, I as I was going through my Bible studies and reading the Bible and reading other people's studies, I just really came to the conclusion in my heart that if you don't believe that God is here and wants to touch you and wants to be with you, how could you believe the Bible at all? If you, if you, if you don't believe that God is real, He's supernatural. He, he's in the business of doing supernatural things. And the Bible is simple knowledge. And it's knowledge to be used by man to do the works that man can do with knowledge. That is anti-Christ. Men doing good works with their knowledge that they got and showing the world the good things they did does not show the world God. It does not show the world Christ. It does not show the world the power and awesomeness of God. It shows the world the power and awesomeness of man. Of what man can do when they get together and, and pat each other on the back and think good thoughts. God doesn't need us to take his truths and put our works with them to show him how much better we are. God wants to reveal himself through our failures so that the world and Satan himself can see the glory of God, not the glory of God's creation. This is a big deal. This is where a lot of well-meaning Christians start reading the Word and they start feeling better about themselves and then they become useless to God. The closer you get to God, the more inadequate you're going to feel. Not the more adequate you're going to feel. Do you understand this? There's never going to be a place in your life where you think, yeah, I'm a good Christian. No wonder God uses me. Fail, 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 fail. How many people have met Christians like that? That their focus in reading the word, their focus in serving God is to become a better person, to become better, to show the world the work of God in their life by the goodness that they do. I want to show the world how much I suck, and the glory and power of God despite my suckage. And that's what I got out of this Bible study. So when you're done, you're like, Pastor Mike, you've got a real weird way of looking at things. Because today we're going to talk about the awareness of the presence of God. When you become aware of the presence of God, 
you become aware of your inadequacies. You become aware that the things that God is doing, you are completely inadequate to do. You become aware that there's nothing you can add to this equation but being a cheerleader. But doing what you know to do and hoping God does something. You know, this week we were, uh, my family nights, normally Monday night, and Monday night I go home, and there just happens to be the miniseries, the Bible, is being reran on the History Channel, and those people took so many liberties, it's disgusting, okay? Um, they, they dramatized it. They made it the Jerry Springer version of the Bible, okay? But there's one thing they did. They kept true to the principles of who God is. And that is that the people of God suck, and God does awesome things regardless of their suckage. And he always does it right about the time the people of God turn their backs on him because they feel inadequate. Over and over again, we saw, as we were watching this for about three hours, we saw the inadequateness of the people of God and then we saw God come through and declare and display his glory and his awesomeness. At least they stuck to that. It's hard not to, otherwise you'd have to change the whole Bible. If we become aware of the presence of God and who he is, and what he has in store for us as the people of God, we will become sorely aware starkly aware that what he intends to do, we cannot do. God marches the people of Israel to the Red Sea. They look at their circumstances and begin to bicker and moan. Why? Because they were gazing upon the outward expression of life, instead of gazing upon the God who had just delivered them through supernatural things from Egypt. They were standing in front of a thing that could not be done by them. And because they could not see God, they could not see his power, they were not looking upon him. And when they did, they were like, what are we supposed to do? And they thought they were the only answer. They began to bicker, bicker and moan and complain. And God had put them in front of the Red Sea on purpose so he could do something that they could not do. Do you think God part of the Red Sea because he wanted a really good special effect in the year 2012 when they did that movie. No. He parted the Red Sea because he was trying to convince his people who he was. He did not part the Red Sea for the army of Egypt because he was about to kill them. He parted the Red Sea so the people of God would snap out of their personal experiences, snap out of what they know, and put their eyes upon a God that is so much bigger than they are, they can't even fathom what's about to happen. Did they learn their lesson? A few of them. Two, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say, one for each tablet? Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever felt like you were the only one in the room that realized how, God, how awesome God was? Join the club. Joshua and Caleb were like, yeah. Everybody else was like, we're going to die.
God is omnipresent. Let's go here. We're going to talk about the presence of God and us becoming aware of his presence. I am God who is near, declares the Lord, and not a God far off. Can a man hide himself in the hiding places so I do not see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord? God is everywhere. Without exception, he is not just in all the universe. The universe is surrounded and encompassed by him. I love it. <laughs> if this is you, I'm not picking on you. I have no clue you said this this week. I love it when people come to church and they say, Pastor Mike, I'm just not feeling God. I just don't feel his presence anymore. I'm just not, I'm just, I feel like I'm far away from God. What they're saying is, I am in disobedience to God. I am focused on my own personal life, and I do not feel God anymore. Here's why they're saying that. Because God is standing right beside them. If they don't feel him, it's because they're not looking at him. It's because they don't have their arms out, stretched, groping for him. What are they looking for? Self-experience. So when someone comes to me and says, I just don't feel God anymore, Pastor Mike, I look at them and go, well, stop being a sucky Christian. Stop. I, I, you, you know, you, you don't want to just tell somebody the truth when they're complaining? Anybody? I have a horrible problem with this because I just do. It's horrible. I, I try really hard to be sensitive and caring and sweet and I do ask I, if you ask my wife she, she tells you she oh yes she does I somebody comes to me and says I just want to say to them stop being selfish stop focusing on your experience stop focusing on what you are having in life stop focusing on you and you will feel and see God Do you know why I can say that with absolute confidence? Because God is everywhere, and he's standing right next to me when I'm saying it. As a matter of fact, God is doing this in the face of the person I'm talking to. <laughs> because the Bible says he's everywhere. The Bible tells me that God's presence doesn't change. Nothing can change his presence. You praying will not change the power of the presence of God. You fasting will not change the power of the presence of God. All those things do is cause you to become less so God can become more. All those things do is they de-emphasize you and emphasize God, which allow you to see his presence for the first time in your life. That's, sorry, it is a preaching sermon, sorry. That is God. He's omnipresent. He's right there with you. And his presence doesn't change. How many of you have ever felt the presence of God so strongly that you couldn't stand? You were scared to death and you were filled with unbelievable experience and you're like, holy cow, do you know that that presence has never changed? And you're like, well, why? Why do I feel it differently sometimes? Because of you. Be I spit on. I spit so much. I spit on my glasses. Glory to God. <laughs> because of you, you don't experience God every day. We don't experience Him like that every day because we're focused on me. We don't go to God in praise and prayer, telling Him how awesome He is, thanking Him for what He's done for us, thanking Him for all the blessings He's poured out upon us, thanking Him for all the hardships because we're so excited to see what He's going to do in our lives. No, we go to Him complaining about how we feel because how we feel is the most important thing in the universe. That's what Oprah said. <laughs> Dr. Phil, how does that make you feel? 
Somebody should turn around and say to him, why, does it, why is that relevant? <laughs> Pastor Mike, you don't care how people feel. Right, I don't. Because if I start caring about how people feel, I'm going to lose out on what God told me to do. I'm going to miss out on God. If I start caring about how I feel and about how other people feel. God is everywhere without exception. He is not just in all the universe. The universe is surrounded by him. God's omnipresence is a key characteristic of who he is in relationship to us. He says, I am. God calls himself Yahweh, meaning I am in Exodus 3.14. Of course, this is not only to be understood time-wise, Revelation 4.8, but also reasonably wise. Not just in the moment, but everywhere. Emmanuel, in the Old Testament, Jesus is announced in Isaiah 7.14, God is with us. God has a general desire to be close to human beings. Did you know that? God did not make you so you could go do work and he could come back and see if you got it done. God made you so he could be with you as you accomplish his goal. It's not about what you're doing. It's about doing something with you. I grew up in church all my life. Ain't nothing worse than a bunch of church women getting together and talking. Ain't nothing good going to happen but sin. I don't care how spiritual you think you are, church ladies. If you ain't got nothing to do but talk about how you feel, you're in danger. If you ain't got nothing to do but to talk about what you're going through, how God, you're in danger. Because we are human beings. Women are emotional creatures, and their emotions are the centralized point of who they are. That's why you're supposed to worship God with your emotions, because God wants to take those and use them to just blow your mind. I have taken so much heat over the years for not encouraging the women of the church to get together and talk to each other. No, they need to get together and do something. Why? Because if they don't, they're just going to cause problems. I, this is not from me just having an idea in my brain. This is from me actually being involved in ministry and leadership for decades and trying to, trying to figure out a way we can have women and men get together. Men are just as bad, but we talk about perverse things. We immediately go to farting and belching and sex. I mean, that's all it goes. Farting, belching, sex, and killing things, you know, and sports, yeah, which is hurting things, you know. I have tried, I have tried over and over again to come up with ways that we could get together in the church and just do the things that the people want to do. It never works. It always goes to people doing things and talking about things they shouldn't be talking about. Why? Because our focus in life cannot be us. We don't need to get together and share with one another how we feel. Okay, I had a bunch of men say that. Let's try. We don't need to get together and share with each other how we feel so our value in our feelings uh, is, uh, is validated by somebody else. Yeah. There you go. Well, Pastor Mike, I just don't feel like anybody cares. Well, we probably don't. Well, what kind of church are you? Well, we're trying to focus on God. Well, you don't care about how I feel? Sure, I care about how you feel. I care that you don't put so much attention on how you feel. You're like, what kind of jerk are you? I have people like, oh, poor Beth. Poor Beth and those poor little girls being raised in that home with that mean man who just 
Folks, I'm the biggest teddy bear, squishy, fat guy you've ever seen in your life. Amen. Every night I sit down and my kids, every, day, every night I sit down and my kids crawl up on me and I'm the sand man. I sit there and they crawl on me and they go. <laughs> I'm the biggest, most emotional person you're ever going to meet as far as a man goes. I love emotion. I love to be passionate. I am as passionate as anybody you've ever going to meet. But I know how dangerous my emotions and passions are, not because I'm so wise. Because <laughs> I've screwed up my life enough by paying attention to them. Yeah. Anybody have a testimony on that part? God has a general desire to be close to human beings. This is what he created us for and why he created us in his image. God wants to be with you as you work together to accomplish his purposes. Contrary to most Christian songs, contrary to many evangelical and pop culture church pastors you hear on TV and the radio, God is not up in heaven worried about how you feel right now. God is worried about who you're looking at. And for you to think that he is worried about how you feel means you completely don't understand who God is. As a matter of fact, your feelings, your passion, is what is supposed to propel you to God. And instead, we use it to propel ourselves to selfish indulgence and a life of sin. We rationalize our sinful desires because it's how we feel. And if I can't change, I, I, you know, I can't change how I feel. Father, I desire that they be with me where I am. John 17, 24, that was Jesus. That they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far off from each one of us. Acts 17, 27. When was the last time you groped for God? Most of us are like, I don't feel God. Well, I must be going to the wrong church. The pastor must not have preached the right sermon. The worship team must not have sang the right song. My Sunday school class must not be caring enough. My small group, just, they just don't act like they care. That's why I can't feel God. God is right here next to you. He's <laughs> in this one Bible uh, study I read, I, I love what the author said. He said, God is closer to you than you are. He knows more about you than you do. He senses more about you than you do. He cares way more about me than I do. God's presence doesn't change ever. There is not a deeper presence of God ever. I'm going to have to. There's a song out there that I absolutely love the song. I absolutely love the song. It's just wrong. When people sing it, they're just wrong. The concept of the whole song is wrong. 
goes, all who are thirsty, all who are weak, come to the Father, come to the spring of life. And the chorus goes, come, Lord Jesus, come. Now, we got two things here. We can either say that it's, they're saying, come back and re- come back in your, on your return, Jesus. But that's not for us to say. Do I really think I'm going to, God, send Jesus back. <laughs> Once again, thinking too much of ourselves. Or we, we could say, and I had a, a, a group of worship people, they got mad at me once. Most of them left the church since then. Um, but uh, they got mad at me because I said, we're not going to sing that song because it's too confusing for people. They, it's either going to take them down to a theological incorrect viewpoint or it's going to um, lead them to thinking they can tell Jesus to come back and focusing on Jesus' return rather than what God has for them right now. Okay? And they got mad at me. I said, well, if let's just, most people who listen to that song in an emotional way, they start saying, come, Lord, come to me, Jesus, and help me. Because the, ver- the, the verses are, all who are weary, all who are awake, come to the fountain, come to the spring of life. So they're, they're saying, come, Jesus, and give me the spring of life. That's theologically incorrect. So why would we sing it? Because it makes me feel good, Pastor Mike. It really does. He said, and I, lo- I actually looked at, at the worship team, and I said, change the words, and we'll sing it. I love the song. I absolutely love the song. All who are weary, all who are weak, come to the fountain, come to the spring of life. Man, that's awesome, man. You come to the fountain, come to the spring of life. But when you get there, you don't say, come, Lord Jesus, come. He's already there. So in our Bible, in, in, our, in our Psalms, we're teaching people incorrect theology. We're teaching them that they've got to pray down Jesus. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You know, I've been in a Pentecostal church where we pray down Jesus. Because we're stupid and we don't know, and we don't read our Bible. Jesus is standing there going, and we're going, come Lord, and he's going, Andy, come up here for a second. <laughs> oh, it's a beautiful way. Come on, come on. You're going to be my object lesson. I want you to raise your hands and, like you're really loving Jesus, look up in the sky and go, come, Lord Jesus, come. Just say, keep saying it. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, come Lord, Lord Jesus, come. And Jesus is going. See, keep saying it. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. <laughs> keep going. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. All right, thank you. Do you see how stupid that is? Thank you, thank you. I mean, do you, do you understand? It's like, come, Lord Jesus. I heard that song this week, and I'm like, oh! I was quickly wrapping my head in duct tape so it wouldn't explode. <laughs> the universal... Versus the manifest presence of, of God. <coughs> Fail. I've never heard the universal presence or the manifest presence of God. You uh, Pentecostal, supernatural believing people in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost. You've probably been taught about the, the universal presence or the manifest, manifest presence of God. One problem. It's just the presence of God. He's there all the time with just as much power as he ever has. There's not a deeper presence of God. I want to, you know, have you been around us, super spiritual Christian? I want to go deeper into the presence of God. Really? Well, that's going to lead you to mysticism. And how many people have been in churches like that? Where all of a sudden they started acting like weirdos. Uh, not, not that they're talking in other tongues. I'm saying they're like doing things that aren't biblical because it's what I feel, and God has revealed this to me. Okay, Nina Kim. There is not a deeper presence of God. 
The presence of God is the presence of God. The Holy of Holies is the Holy of Holies. There's not a secret place somewhere you haven't been to. Oh, wait, that's what Satan did to Eve. Did you get that? How many of you? Raise your hand if you got what I just said. Thank you. See, so you didn't raise your hand, so, and they're looking at me intently like, explain yourself. See, in the garden, Eve was told, don't do that. And she was like, okay. She was like, Debbie, okay. <laughs> it was a compliment. You, you tell Debbie to do something, she's like, okay. Not a whole lot thought to it, just very, very simple. Just love to obey. She goes walking through the garden. She walks by the tree. Satan goes, Sst, come over here. Sst. I want to show you something. She went over. Yes. And what he did to her was, he said something like this, God is holding out on you. He's keeping something from you. Don't you want more? If you'll take this and eat it, you'll have more. Your eyes will be open, and you will see like God sees. And how many of us are like, <laughs> and if I, if I see the things God sees, then I could get this, and I could do this, and I could, oh. And people would think I'm special and <gasps> God's presence doesn't change. His holiness, his awesomeness is his awesomeness. Do you think Satan would love to give you something? that feels like God, but isn't. Oh, yeah. That's his old game he's been playing for years. It feels godly, but it's not. It feels so right, Pastor Mark. Really? Well, if the feeling was all that matters, then you win the prize. But it isn't. There is not a deeper presence of God ever. Remember this, folks. This is critical for you to remember. God's presence is God's presence. What does the Bible tell us about God's presence? What happens in the presence of God? Well, there's several things we can remember. Uh, Moses was in the presence of God one time, and he had to hide himself because he was about to explode The presence of God would fall upon people and they would fall prostrate before the Lord, filled with fear, but also amazement of the awesomeness of God. We turn the word awesome into something that's pleasing our feelings rather than fear, because fear is evil in the world we live in. Except the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Awesomeness of God means something that instills fear, but is so powerful, you're like, <gasps> We read in the Old Testament that when the, when the priest would go into the holy and the holies of holies, the presence of God, that the power of God was so strong 
so powerful, so mighty, that if there was any sin in the priest that walked in, what would happen? Death. He'd just fall over dead. They'd have to drag him out by a rope. They're like, how did, how did they know he'd, he died? Well, they, weren't, they didn't sit out there outside the tent with their <laughs> ear on the ground going, no, no, they tied a, they tied a bell around his toe. They tied bells on him. If the bell stopped ringing, <laughs> pull him out. <laughs> I say all those things. You should read about when people experience the glory and the power and the presence of God. Why did they take the Ark of the Covenant into battle with them? Because that's the thing that won the battle, not them. The presence of God. The glory of God. <coughs> There's one thing we see every time. Every time in the Bible we talk about the glory and the presence of God. We see the inadequacy of flesh. Every time. Every time we see the glory of God. We see the inadequacy of flesh and of man. We see there's no comparison. It's not like I'm standing here and I'm 10 feet tall and God's standing there and he's 100 feet tall. No, no, no. When we see God and his glory, we can't see me. I, you can't see me. Have you ever had a little black speck? Like a real little one. And then you put a big bright light behind it and the speck went away? That's what you, in the presence of God, is like. You are encompassed by his glory, and you become irrelevant. And here's the most beautiful thing about the presence of God. Even though in our minds we are irrelevant in the glory and the presence of God, he longs for your passion for him. Even though we're insignificant in his presence, insignificant in, with him around us, he still wants you to cry out with your passion and your love for him. Let me say something. This is what Christianity is about. It's not about doing the right things. It's not about reading your Bible and going to church. It's about you loving God with all your heart, so much so that you live in the glory and the presence of God every moment you possibly can. Psalm 139 says, Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in show, behold, you are there. There are times Uh, there are times when we experience God's presence in a stronger way. God is always with us. He's, his universal presence is always with us. But his presence is not always felt. And the reason, or ma manifest, and the reason it is, it's not due to God decreasing and increasing his presence, but it fully depends on our perception, our awareness, our proper place in his presence. If you are filled with fear of the circumstances, that's your fault. If you are consumed with worry, that is your fault. Because there cannot be worry in the presence of God. You're like, Pastor Mike, you're a jerk. Yeah, I am. Let me tell you something, folks. I don't say that because I want to be mean to people. I don't say that because I'm heartless. I don't say that because I'm not sympathetic or empathetic. I say it. Because I want you to succeed. There's a selfish part of me that says, I also don't want to have to hear you whine. But I really say it because I want you to succeed. I want you to know the truth. This, this week, we were in Bible study with the, the, the men from the shelter. And this one guy says, you know what God said to me? Because I really felt God say, if I'm for you, 
who could be against you. If everything in this world is a little black speck that disappears when it's put up to the glory and the power of God, and inside that little black speck, there are things that are, seem to be destroying you and eating at you and devouring you. And you stand up in the presence and glory of God, and you take your gaze off of the little speck, and you put it upon the big light. The stuff that's happening to you becomes irrelevant. It doesn't mean it goes away. It means it doesn't matter. And here's the worst part. And if it matters to you, that's evidence of your relationship with God. One problem. It's not a good evidence. Pastor Mike, don't you think that the devil comes after me and attacks me in my spiritual, spiritual places? Yeah, yeah, I think he does. And I think he does because God told him to. Because <laughs> God wants to see if you keep your focus on him instead of you. However, this is not due to God's decreasing and increasing his presence. It fully depends on our perception of his presence. Manifest presence is nothing else but realized universal presence and is caused by us becoming aware of the fact that God is near us. That we become aware that God is right here. He knows me more than I know me. Nothing more than realized universal presence and is caused by becoming aware of the fact that God is near. I used to lead worship in a Pentecostal church and they thought that we had to pray down the glory of God. Used to drive me nuts. I'd be up there singing, jazzing everybody up, getting them all excited. Jim was on stage with me, it's his fault. <laughs> Just joking. And, uh, and we'd, people like, well, you know, and the pastor would say, sing that song. We're, we're really not there yet. Well, <laughs> why don't we try this? What does a song matter? Why does how the guitar player plays matter? If it matters to you, then you're not really worshiping God. What would happen if a group of people had a relationship with Jesus Christ so, and God the Father in heaven through the power of the Holy Spirit, so real that we just pushed past all the carnal things of this world and consistently walked with him, consistently was in his presence. Would he be able to do things? Yeah. We come to church and we sing songs. And we get up here and worship, not because we need to for God to move, because you need it to get your mind off of the things of the world. I went to church with people that they had such an awareness of the presence and the power of God, that if we got in the room and said, let's pray, we didn't need any music, we didn't need nothing. All we need to do is start praying, start crying out to God. And it was like, <laughs> the glory and the power of God was there. Why? Because we said, hey, let's get rid of this crap that we're carrying around with us. Let's focus on God for a second. All right, let's take it off, like taking it off a backpack. Just hang it on the wall and say, all right. That reminds me, my children are going to want me to burn this 
file on the computer here in a little bit, but it reminds me of, you know how little kids are. They are just, I'm in your presence, here I am. You know what I mean? It's only when they become aware of what people think about them. Do they change that attitude of, I'm accepted for who I am. I got a poopy butt, mommy. Can you help me clean it? At what point in their life do they go, well, anybody know I have a poopy butt? The other day, my wife and I were getting ready to go on a date, and the kids were asleep. The, the two little twins were asleep. We pulled out front of the house and said goodbye to Arabelle and Allison and Ariana. We just happened to look up to the f window where the little girl's bedroom is. And there's Lexi, completely naked, standing <laughs> in the window, going, Daddy! Daddy! And then all of a sudden, Lena's standing there, Mommy! No diaper, no nothing. Completely accepted by all in the yard. <laughs> Are those children perfect? Absolutely not. <laughs> Do I care? Absolutely not. Why do you care? Why is it that we can become a situation where we care? <laughs> Why can't we just stand in the presence of God and go, <sighs> Huh? Anybody? I don't know. I, I don't worry about getting poop on myself. God's big enough to wipe it off. I want to ask a question. If he is always here, what is he doing? Remember asked that question? If God is always here with me, what is he doing? He's right next to me. What's he doing? He's always here? Well, he's right here. Don't anybody take this video and send it to a psychiatrist. <laughs> Psalm 16 and 8. Because he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Psalm 73, 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. Yeah. You ever walk to a store with a little kid? Yeah, it's like this. Daddy, where are we going to go? Anybody ever throw a fit on your daddy in the store? I did once. <laughs> I think I tried it with mom a couple times. But or mom. No, it wasn't, trust me. <laughs> mom, it's like my family. My mom is neater than my dad. My, my kids are like, Daddy, please whip us. Don't let mommy whip us. <laughs> it's like, well, why? It's not because you're, you know, whip harder. It's just mommy's crazy. It's normal. That's normal. Mommy's emotional, and Daddy's like, come here. <laughs> Don't do it anymore. <laughs> He's right next to me, and I'm holding his hand. You ever seen a kid walking down the middle of the aisle by themselves, and all of a sudden, Something happens in that aisle, that aisle that they're afraid of. What do they do? Freeze. They freeze. They look around. They cry, Molly! 
You ever see a kid walking down the aisle with their daddy? Holding daddy's hand. And something happens that scares them. And what do they do? <laughs> you know, most of us get caught down the aisle by ourselves all the time. And we're frantically looking for God. And because of that, we fail. <laughs> and you know what? God sent the mean guy down the aisle on purpose. To remind you that you were on your own. To prove to you, you need him. Because you've forgotten him. I got this. Okay. The third thing he's doing is God is gazing at me with pleasure. Most of us, we see God either like we saw our parents or we see ourselves. We see him in that context. I see God like me sitting on my recliner and my children are dancing. Daddy, Daddy, we, want, we have a show for you. We've been practicing all day. Daddy, Daddy. And my kids literally, they go into the room and they practice and, and then they, they do dances for me. And I, I, get this, I built this little stage for them in my living room. I, I, if you have kids, you should all build a stage for your children in your living room, in your family room. And they stand up on their stage, and they do their show. And I sit there and go, and sometimes I'm like, <laughs> but I wouldn't trade those moments for the world. I will think about those till the day I die. I've recorded some of them so that I can remember them. God is sitting in his big recliner going, the other day, I have to read Arabelle's, I have to grade her schoolwork that's not just like regular automatic school. She's homeschooled, but she's like in this intense online homeschool. It's like kick your butt all over the field homeschool. And I have to grade all of her essays. And like she has three or four essays a week. It was like one of her assignments the other day was read a book. And do a book report, 500 words. Have it done in a couple days. She's in eighth grade. It's like, wham, wham, just kicking her butt. And I, went, I went and I read her book report. I read her book report. And folks, I, re I read this and I said to her, I got home that night, and I said, Errol, did you write that? Because I swear she copied it. There's no way she wrote that. She goes, yeah. She thought she was in trouble. Well, I thought she was in trouble too. <laughs> I looked at her mom. I said, did she really write that? <coughs> yeah. No way. <laughs> I looked at her and I was like, nice job. That was awesome. Was Treasure Island. She wrote her 500 page, 500 word essay. Yeah, 500 page thesis. <laughs> eighth, eighth grade, I'm writing my 500 page thesis on Treasure Island. <laughs> 100 page, 100 page book. There we go. Uh, and it was just, you know, you just sit there and you go, that's God going, oh my, nice job. He wants to sit there and look at you and go, yeah. And he doesn't do it based on anything but your effort. Not your success. <coughs> you 
He says over and over again, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Over and over and over, Jesus said it. Not one of those crazy apostles. Not Peter the woman hater. And Paul. But Jesus. It was th- I'm laughing about that, folks. All scripture is inspired by God, except for some who call themselves Christians. God is standing there gazing at me with pleasure, not because I was successful, but because I was trying my hardest. I was giving him everything. And here's the problem with that, folks. You are not the determiner of everything. You are not the one who decides what all is. You'll know what all is when you're down on your knees begging him, not knowing what else to do. Until then, all hasn't happened. That's a good place for an amen, Chris. We like to get our calculator out and give him all that we decided to give him. That's all of it, God. That's all. That's all you require of me. No, 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 no. no. He requires all. And if you think it's all, and it's not, he's going to help you out with that. I like to say it like this. All is passing out on the way of doing it. All is passing out of exhaustion. Getting up in the morning and being so sick you can't move. Then you know you gave it all. If you've got breath, you haven't given it all. Pastor Mark. Well, what about, I don't care about nothing else. Well, what about my kids? You will be painfully mistaken later on in your life if you're withholding what God wants from you because you want to give it to your children. Won't they, Dan? Here's the worst part, and the damage will be done, and it won't be a one-time spanking. You'll live with it. All means all. All. And you don't get to decide what that is. And neither do I. We'll know it's all when you've collapsed. He is gazing upon me. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Then the king will desire your beauty because he is your Lord. Bow down to him. He's looking at you going, I use this analogy all the time. Imagine standing before your lover and going, your lover knows if you're giving all. You know that commercial I talk about all the time? The guy's looking at this really awesome car, and he's putting his wife in the car, shutting the door for her. He's being a wonderful gentleman, romantic. 
I just bought her some ice cream. He's looking at this awesome car. His wife notices what he's looking at. <laughs> and she goes, as she changes her gaze from him to what he was looking at, this beautiful woman gets out of the car. And she's like, he's like, <gasps> and I love it because I have Kirk Herb Street and Brent Musburger in the background going, oh, he fumbles the ball, and oh, oh, it's over. God knows if it's off. And you don't get to determine it. As a matter of fact, if you're in the business of determining, it's definitely not off. You shouldn't care. Third thing he's doing, and I love this one, he's wooing me with jealousy. What? He's drawing me. He's drawing out my passion with a jealous heart. He wants all me. When I choose sin over God, he doesn't sit there and go, I'm going to send him to hell. He goes, how could you choose that over me? And he doesn't go, I'm getting a lawyer. He sets himself to show me why I should love him more. I know my wife is archaic in her understanding of being a godly wife. Many of you have stated that outwardly. But she's a godly wife. She constantly counsels women, and they're like, my husband doesn't love me. He doesn't show me affection. And she doesn't look at, him and look at them and go, well, let me tell you, you should tell them. You should threaten them with your emotions and you should tell them they better give you what you want. She looks at them and goes, what are you doing to woo them? What are you doing to draw their attention and their affections upon you? And then she tells me, and then I go sit down with the man and say, why are you so selfish? You jerk. Listen, this is key here, guys. Are you focused on being with God, or are you focused on what your relationship with God is going to bring you? Because the difference means you either thought you were in bed with a whore, or you thought you were in bed with your wife. Are you focused on obeying God and loving him and giving him your all? Or are you focused on what God is going to bring in your life? If I'm obedient to God, he'll bless me. <coughs> Sound like a bunch of books we've been hearing about? If I do what God tells me to do, he'll bless me. Here's the worst part, guys. Women, raise your hand if you know that your husband is really loving you and wants to be with you or if he just wants to have sex. If a woman knows this, how much more does God know this about you? How much more does God know that you don't love him because you're giving him your all and you want to obey him and you want to be with him, but you're loving him because you expect him to bless you in return? Do you know why God is holding out on your blessing? 
because he knows you don't really love him. What? God's going to not bless you. Why? Because you don't really love him. You're using him like a two-cent whore. Or $20 whore now, I guess. <laughs> That's what you're doing. You're, going, you're giving God a little bit so that you can get what you want. I want to say this to you. This is for somebody in the room because God showed it to me earlier this week and he just reminded me. Here we go, ready? Some of you are questioning whether you're doing what you're supposed to be doing because God doesn't seem to be doing what you expected him to do. Folks, if God wanted it to happen, it would happen. So the fact is, he doesn't want it to happen. The question we should have is, why? And the answer is, because you are focused on the outcome instead of God. You know, that man going to his wife just wanting to have sex. Doesn't really care about her. He's supposed to have sex because he's horny. Seriously. Every man knows what I'm talking about, and every woman knows what I'm talking about. And if you think you're offended, be offended, because that's a critical part of being a human being. God is always wooing me with jealousy, jealousy for your heart and your mind and your soul and all that you have. He wants you. He doesn't want you to bring him your works. He wants you to bring him you. Sure, works are going to be a part of it, but that's not the point. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am a very jealous, I'm very jealous for Zion. I'm burning with jealousy for her. God is not passive. He is actively calling us to join him. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Who long to be with him. To increase our awareness, we must fix our eyes upon the Lord, and we must work to join him. We must do what we must to join him. We must take our passions off of what we want and put them upon God. And let me say this to you. Any passion... That is not what God has for you, and is not God, will be a tool that will lead you astray. I promise. Any. You're like, who are you saying? I'm saying that you should put all your passions with the Lord and let Him fulfill your desires, and not hold one back for yourself because you don't think God understands. I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my, uh, my, my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely, Psalm 16. How to practically connect with the truth of God's immediate presence in our life. One, thankfulness. 
have an increased awareness of his presence. Doubt will vanish as we proclaim and thank him for the truth of his presence. Nate said it to somebody a couple last week. He said, two weeks ago, he said, you know, this whole singing thing at church, you know, it's sort of hard to just like, really, we're just going to get together and sing? That's weird. Because, you know, it used to be that was normal. That was, we get, people loved to sing because music was fresh and new and n- new instruments were really creative and amazing. And today, we had we can make instruments with our phones. We can, we can do anything we want, man. We can record and we can do all kinds of stuff. Nate could have recorded a whole song just in this time I was doing my sermon and, and produce it almost professionally on his phone. Chris can make this guitar, make any sound he wants. He can literally program a sound into this little box, and when he strums that right there, it'll do it. I mean, he could, he could program a fart sound in it. And he could be going, <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> I mean, music is so different. And, and so many times in our society, we're like, we're going to get together and sing? Really? What do you do? Where's the light? Where's the funk? Where's the visual aids while we're singing? You know, this is really boring. Nate said to this one kid who's like totally like, I don't get this singing thing, man. He said, you know, after a while, you just try it. Try pouring your heart and soul out to God practically. Try physically pouring your heart and soul out to God with your voice. Try doing it with your heart. How many of you guys know when you listen to somebody sing, you can tell if they're singing with their heart or if they're just singing to sing songs? It's pretty obvious. You ever watch The Voice? You can tell. I mean, it's so obvious, and almost nobody wins that doesn't sing with their heart. It's something that God designed to move his people. It was made by God to move us. And Nate said to this kid, he's like, you know, just try it, and it grows on you. And then you're like, And you just can't wait to sing and cry out to God and tell him what you think of him. I'm going to tell you what I think of you, God. You're awesome. <laughs> That's a guy's perspective of worship and praise. <laughs> guys are like, you the man. <laughs> Billy Bob. <laughs> you don't believe me. Go home this afternoon and watch these guys score touchdowns and see what they do. We're weird, and if anybody thinks that we're higher than the animals, you should just watch this afternoon. And you will understand that millions and millions of people across this world are watching this, going, yeah, I just love this. God created us with passion, and he wants us to give our passion back to him with thankfulness and wholeness of heart. He wants us, we should start meditating upon the Lord. We should start setting and just thinking about God. You want to increase understanding of his presence? Just introduce basic facts about his presence. There is so much more to it. Mining the depths of his truth will sharpen our understanding and give us divine revelation that will further transform our lives. If we will sit there in his presence and just meditate upon him with the word of God and just focus on God. Say, God, tell me what you want me to know. Don't start reading the Bible because you've got to get to the end of the chapter so you can check off the box on your stupid Bible checklist. <laughs> yes, I called it a stupid Bible checklist. Jeez, I'm going to hear about that. <laughs> Number three, sorry. Remind ourselves. most important aspect when desiring to constantly live in God's presence. It is important to remind ourselves of his presence over and over again throughout the day 
in order for it to become manifest presence. It means constantly aligning ourselves in our everyday life and all its tasks, situations, and troubles. We must remind ourselves. Constantly, this is where the people of God come in. I mean, ever walked in the room and just started vomiting all over everybody, and somebody, f- somebody who really loved you said, okay, thanks for sharing. Now, could you share with us something awesome God did in your life? And, and then you're like, oh, you've forgotten that God is right there beside you. Could you imagine God standing right there beside you going, and you're going, this is stupid. I hate this. This is ridiculous. God, why are you letting this happen to me? Why is this happening to me? Oh, God, this is stupid. God's going. My wife has to do that every once in a while to me. She just smiles. She's like, honey, I think you need to go to bed. I think so, too. You want to suck my thumb and go to sleep. It'll get better in the morning. Meh, meh, meh. Sounds like squishy, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We must constantly remind us, and it's great to have people in the body of Christ to remind us. But how many of you would be offended if you came to church and you had this big long list of crybaby stuff, and, and somebody said, you know, thanks for sharing, but, you know, God's bigger than all that, isn't he? And, you know, he's standing right next to you. Why are you focused on it? You'd be like, those people don't care. I don't feel like they care about me and what I'm going through. Well, we don't. Why do you? I said this to the guys in Bible study, or uh, not the guys and the ladies in Bible study on Wednesday night. I said, you know, we must devalue our emotions, our feelings. They're only there to add color. Let me give you an analogy. If I walk up and God says, there's going to be a tree there, and at that tree, I want you to fall on your knees and worship me. I get to the tree and I'm like, God, the tree's leaves are red. I don't think this is the tree God wants me to pray at. Emotions are simply the colors. One day you might walk up to that tree and the the tree leaves be yellow. The next day there might be black. The next day there might be green. The next day there might be red. Who cares? It's pretty cool. We could go to the tree that God told us to fall on our knees every morning and go, Wow, well, what color is the tree going to be today, God? Uh, oh, that's cool. It's multicolored. I'm feeling the rainbow. <laughs> yeah, we, and we grab a bunch of leaves and go, Ooh, Skittles. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, Instead, we go there, and we're like, God, I don't know if I can worship you. The tree's black today, and it must be a sign, God. It must be a sign that the tree's black. What's the sign? And Satan's there going, I think I know what the sign is. You must devalue your emotions and your feelings if you're ever going to experience God. I didn't say make them useless. I mean devalue them. In the world we live in, emotions and feelings are the most important thing. It keeps us from obeying God. You don't believe me? Over the last two months, how many times have you missed church because of how you felt? How many times have you stepped out to do something that God wanted you to do and things changed in your life and you quit because of how you felt or the experience that you were having? If you're going to walk with God and become aware of his presence in your life all the time, 
You must, you must, you must devalue your emotions and feelings. When you devalue them, you can enjoy them. Because they don't mean anything but what color the tree is. It's there for your enjoyment. It would suck if every day the tree you went, I want you to think about this, if every day the tree you went to stand before God and praise God at was the same color, it would suck. And you're like, well, it would, would it? Uh, well, it would if you knew every day it could be a different color. What would be really cool is once you get in line with God and you come to that tree every day excited about worshiping God with your heart to God, and every day the tree seems to mimic your emotions. So you're like, Dad, God, I really don't feel good today, and the tree's gray. And you're like, God, thank you for, for knowing that. Thank you for, for seeing how I feel today. That's pretty cool. And you show up the next day, and you're all excited, and, it's, and the tree's bright orange. You're like, well, that's really cool, God. And your emotions become fun. Color in your life instead of what life's about. What's really special is when you get there and the tree's gray, and when you're done praising God, it's orange. Or light blue. Or your favorite color. Or your heart's really moved for God. And you're really passionate about going and doing something, and the tree's red. And fire burning off of it. You're like, wow, that's cool. See, God gave us emotions on purpose, not to run our lives, but to enjoy them. And that goes right into the last one. If we want to be aware of God's presence on a consistent basis in our lives, we must find ourselves being obedient. Increases confidence. Obedience increases confidence in his presence. Our expectation of his presence will radically grow as we walk in the things he tells us and obey his will. We will not only feel closer, but also receive his truth much more easily than we will, than, than when we live in compromise to obedience. How many of you guys want to know what God wants you to do? So you can calculate the cost. God, tell me what you want me to do, because I'm not sure if I want to do it or not. It's like, hey, God, if you don't give me exactly what you want me to do by this time tomorrow, I don't think I'm going to be able to show up and do it tomorrow. The next day, because you know what? I got to understand exactly what you want me to do. And I've got to think this through. I've got to plan exactly how I'm going to do what you asked me to do. You know, you can't just be moving my cheese all the time. I love it when God's just like, go. Oh. I was pre preparing for this sermon. I had this big, long list of notes. I mean, it's huge. I, printed up, I was going to print them out. I printed out the slides, and I couldn't print off my notes. And I went and got some more paper. We ran out of paper. And I was printing. I'm hitting print. I hit print three times. And every time I sent that thing to print, it said error. <laughs> I printed something else, and it printed. And I tried to print that. It said error. And I'm like, oh, wait. God wants me to do this without my notes. Trust me, it was way better without my notes. You're like, dude, that must have really sucked with your notes. <laughs> Anyways, um. God wants us, we have to be obedient. We have to focus on obeying God regardless of what we think. We actually have to obey him without thought. How many of you guys have realized the more you think about what you, God asks you to do, the more you screw it up? Yeah, it's horrible. Just make sure it's what God told you to do and do it. Don't try to figure out how it's going to get done. Th 
This is things we need to do. Let's get undistracted. Let's set our gaze upon the Lord. Let us set aside the things that so easily cause us to forget who is with us. If God is for me, standing right beside me, why do I fear? Well, the reason I fear is I'm not aware of his presence. Here's the thing. Mike, this one's for you. I'm not picking on you. But why do I swing and fight? Why do I swing and fight? Why am I standing there and I'm scared and I don't know what to do? Why do I swing and fight? The battle is the Lord's, not mine. And Satan's just trying to get me to swing. Because the moment I swing, who am I putting trust in? Me. Who have I become unaware of? God. Cursed is the man who trusts a man and makes his flesh his strength. His heart has turned from the Lord. He will be like a wasteland in the desert. His gaze has turned from being with God and turned upon himself and his circumstances, and he pulls out his sword and he swings or he throws a punch. Mike shared this week his last job. Mike goes like, he's eating really good. He's going like three or four months at a time before he swings. He used to swing like every other week. And he had this job, and he really sort of liked the job. It was a very different kind of job. It wasn't, it wasn't like factory work. It was a very different kind of job. And, and he sort of liked it, and he was hoping they were going to make him full time. The company seemed to be like a really good company. And he was asking for full time, and he wanted full time. And that morning, the, his, his uh, supervisor, who he didn't like, put in a recommendation for him to get this position for full time. And then later that afternoon, she asked him to do something that was, for lack of better words, it wasn't, it wasn't thoughtful to Mike. And he swung. And he got fired. No, he swung. He lashed out. He, well, this isn't fair. This isn't fair. You shouldn't treat me that way. And he said it to his supervisor. And he fought for himself. If you don't stand up for yourself, who's going to? Well, who are you focused on? God or you? And he testified this week about how God revealed to him later that this woman had put in for him to get this job. And then she had to fire him because he swung. God had already moved on his behalf. God had already taken care of it for him. And Satan was like, come on, do it. Hit me, hit me. Come on, you better do something about that. You better do something about that. Don't let those people disrespect you. Stand up for yourself. Come on. Come on. You ever been in a situation where you thought you had to do something or the world was going to collapse? <sighs> and Satan's sitting there going, what are you going to do? Come on, you can't just stand there and not do something about this. This is ridiculous. You've got to do something. And you should, yeah, exactly. You should turn to Satan and go, I am going to do something. God, what are you trying to do here? God had already moved on Mike's behalf. I want you to think about that. Have you ever been in that situation? Where God had already moved on your behalf, and then you, before you realized it was happening, you stepped up and you took care of it and made a mess. Reminds me of a Saul, King Saul. He was waiting for the prophet. 
Samuel, right? Samuel, yeah. He's waiting for the prophet Samuel to come and offer the sacrifice. And the men are all freaking out. Come on, come on, man. We've been here for a day and a half. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. We're going to do something. We can just sit here and wait. Right when he went to cut the throat of that sheep, Samuel shows up as he goes, and he goes, well, that'll be the end of you. And it was. Because it wasn't because he cut the neck of the sheep. It wasn't because he did it wrong. It wasn't because he didn't wait a certain amount of time. It was because he didn't obey God. And he didn't obey God because he took his eyes off of God and put it upon the circumstances in his life. How many times have we sat there and we knew what God said about a circumstance and we couldn't wait? We knew what God said. We knew he said, don't do this. And we said, this is my only hope. And we take it upon ourselves and we fix it. And what happens? Life, everlasting, the glory of God falls upon us? No. A, a season of destruction, hurt, and pain. And God can take your screw-up and use it and turn it around to work all things for his glory, but I would like to help you stop screwing up first. You know, you can come to church here today, and I could make you all warm and fuzzy. I could have you all set up, and I could run behind you and flop up 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 the pillows underneath your rear ends and then have you set back down and you can feel good you say man that pastor mike really made me feel good today i can tell you that god can take all things all your screw-ups every time you take your focus off of god and you put it on yourself and you ruin your life god can take those screw-ups and he can use them for his glory i can son turn around i could tell I could suck up to you, and I can make you feel good. And it would all be truth. It would all be truth that God can take all your screw-ups and turn it around and work for his glory. And he can bless you if you finally turn to him and submit your life to him. I can tell you that. Would you rather me tell you that or tell you what I told you this morning? Guess what? The people who want to win want to hear the sermon this morning. The people who care about their feelings want to hear the other one. And I'll just say it. I don't want the people that, want, that care about their feelings in my church. It's too obnoxious to deal with them. You're running around kissing their butt nonstop. <laughs> While you're preaching, you're going to be like, and God said, he loves you. And so do we. Can you imagine? I mean, this is what the, the chickenfication of the NFL is happening right now. God forbid the coach yell at his players. Come on, man. I want to win. I don't want to leave the field a loser, but feeling good about myself. Listen, let me tell you something. There are going to be a lot of people standing before the throne of God, feeling good about themselves, until the hatch opens. They're going to go there, and they're going to be like, I have happy spirit hands when I worship God. <laughs> Jesus loves me. And they're going to get to heaven. And God's going to say, who are you? And they're going to be like, don't you know me? I did this, and I really changed my community. I really did. And so many people knew that Jesus loved them. 
And we fed people. And we even prayed a couple of times and people got healed. And God's going to look at them and go, I have no clue who you are, dude. What are you doing here? And they're going to be like, but how, how, could have, how could have we felt the love of Christ like we felt him? How could we have felt so loved and so accepted if it wasn't you? And God's going to be like, go away. I have no clue who you are. It's not about how you feel. It's about who you know. Do I really want to fluff the pillow of someone who is disobedient to God? No, I want to yank it out from underneath their head. If I care about them, wouldn't I? Oh, we're not going to sit. We're not going to do a response time. We're going to see if they really love Jesus or not. Oh, how we want God to make it about us. Oh, how I love my life. Oh, how I love my life. Why? Do you find yourself not caring about anything but what God has for you? If you don't, you need to repent. Well, Pastor Mike, what? Pastor Mike. What about this? What about that? What, what about it? Those are all man rules. Those are all men trying to focus, trying to make God be a certain way that he wants, they want him to be so that they can feel good about their lifestyle of, of selfishness. Have you ever read the Bible? How often does the Bible record Jesus' life and him worried about how he feels. How often does it record how the apostles sat around and went, Oh, Jesus, I just don't know if I could do this anymore. It's just so hard. And Jesus went, I understand. Read your Bible. We've lost the war in our society. I am a pariah upon the church today in my preaching. They don't like it. People think I'm crazy. I'm not the only one like this. There's people all over the country like me. And they're seeing God move in amazing ways. We're seeing God move in amazing ways. God is changing people's hearts and minds. We're actually having people try it. They're trying. Just go. Okay, here I go. <sighs> Whoa. It's God, serving God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind is so real. Be aware that he is right there with you. He wants to be with you every step of the way. He wants you to feel his presence. He wants you to live inside of his presence all the time. He wants your life to become irrelevant compared to his glory. How about you? Is that what you want? Do you want to look to God? Do you want to 
get undistracted? Do you want to set your gaze upon the Lord? Do you want to set aside the things so, of this world so that you, f you cause us to forget everything else but him? Is that what you want? Because that's what I'm here to do. And this whole sermon is to get you to say that's what you want. And when you walk out of here, you can't willfully sin anymore. Because if you do, that's not really what you wanted. Trust me, we don't have to willfully sin to sin. We stumble across of it just fine. We accidentally fall into it. We stay up too late one night, lose our senses and go stupid. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I tell people all the time, man, there ain't nothing good happening late at night. Nothing. Go to bed, get some sleep, and you won't be so stupid. Anybody testify to that? Yeah. It's amazing. You can't willfully sin anymore because you said you didn't want to. And either you lied or you didn't. Which one is it? Can't be both. You're like, does my good jerk? Yeah. Listen, if you say, I don't want to sin anymore, I want to serve God with all my heart, I want to run after God with all my heart, and then you turn around and, and do what you said you knew was wrong to do, look at me and say, I took my eyes off of God. And I put them on myself. And I was wrong. God forbid we make people do that. God forbid we make people own their disobedience and selfishness. <gasps> You're a jerk. But that, isn't that what it is? I want to know you more so I can have a better life. I could get you all praising God with happy songs. Trust me. You'd be like, <gasps> they do it at rock concerts. How many of you guys ever paid for a ticket to go to a rock concert? <coughs> yeah. Or to a concert at all. We're going to pray. It's not going to be a supernatural, emotional, spiritual prayer unless you make it so. We're going to pray that God helps us to be aware of who He is and where He is. We're going to pray that God helps us to take our eyes off of us and me and what I'm wearing today and what my hair looks like. If I, if I thought about that chain, I'd never get anything done. I'd be like, good God. <laughs> what am I going to do? I wouldn't preach another sermon for months trying to lose the weight. I look at those videos sometimes, I'm like, God, who's the fat, short guy up there screaming? <laughs> it's me! Ah! <laughs> God, we suck. We, wanna, we want our lives to be the way we think they should be. And we're wrong. And it's a thirst and it's a hunger that will never be quenched. Help us to gaze upon you. To realize that you are here right beside me. To realize that you want to be with me. That you want me to be obedient to you so that you can just smile upon me. So I can feel your presence all the time. Help me devalue my life experience. And give you the glory and the praise. And find myself in you. Help me, God, to be in your presence, to feel your glory. Because I need it to remember it.
because I am weak. And I am made of flesh. And my feelings, they tempt me. They torment me. They woo me in the wrong direction. Help me to see your desire, your wooing, your longing to be with me. Help me to choose you. I thank you, God, because I know you're real, and I know you love me. I thank you, God, <laughs> because you are so much more than I can explain. That your presence causes the world to look like a black and white movie with no voice. Compared to your presence, your spirit, your power, your glory. Teach us who you are, God. Help us to find ourselves in your presence. We give you all the glory and the praise. In your holy name, amen. Thanks for being here today, guys. Have a wonderful afternoon.